Welcome. This is episode one. Hi. Kinsey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be the very first episode. Hell yeah. Let's start with some quick introductions. My name is Marina. My pronouns are she, her, and I am so excited to have my good friend Kinsey here with us today. Do you want to introduce yourself? I would love to. Um, My name is Kinsey. I also use she, her pronouns. Um, And I'm excited to be on this show with Marina because before this, we spent, I don't know, a good half a year constantly yelling about this game in each other's DMs (laughs) as it is. So I think we're ready for this. We're so ready to kick us off. Are you staying hydrated? What are you drinking? Thank you for asking. Um, I am staying hydrated. I've got a glass of water, but I also have a giant, like a like a truly hysterically large cup of coffee because my roommate is gone for the weekend, but I made coffee for two like on autopilot and now I can't waste anything. So I'm just going to be bouncing off the walls in about an hour and a half. Amazing. That's also so wholesome and really sweet. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Well, that's okay. I mean, I'm I'm joining you. I have, I don't even know what number of coffee this is and I've got some water, so we're good. Good. Coffee, water, sip, sip back and forth. That's exactly, exactly. A hundred percent. So we're here to talk about Ocarina of Time today, but before we do, Kinsey, want to learn a little bit more about you. What are some of your favorite games and favorite game series? Yeah, well, I think I just have to obligatory say, obviously, The Legend of Zelda. Um, I'm, I'm probably the only person in the world who would definitely only say that. Um, but alongside loving, loving Legend of Zelda, um, some favorites I really love the story of seasons previously harvest moon um I think I grew up with those and it gave me a very ideal uh idealized version of what farming is like and aside from that big fire emblem fan um and any game any game oh yeah oh we can talk about fire emblem for hours too um oh we will we will at some point (laughs) I'll come back Uh, (laughs) but also any game where you are like the shopkeeper for like an rpg town that specific trope is like my favorite mechanic where like you're not the adventurer you're just trying to sell them stuff um i'm not really a huge fan of capitalism but that game i'll I'll give it up i'll give everything up for that kind of game so well there's a certain vibe especially if it's like a remote place and it's like a tight-knit community sure yeah and it's like i'm selling you things to keep you alive i'm not here to make a wild horrible greedy profit yeah exactly exactly (laughs) um I know the answer to this question, and I'm so excited about it, but (laughs) what are you currently playing? Oh my gosh, thank you for asking. Uh, (laughs) I'm currently playing, as you know, uh, Nier Automata for the Switch, Um, and let me tell you, I cannot stop thinking about this game. I get the hype. I thought it was just funky, cool little designs, and I'm already emotional when I'm only a couple hours into this game, so... Yeah, uh, obsessed. Everybody should buy it on your preferred console yes. of choice. Yes, yes, absolutely. But we're not here to talk about Nier Automata. You'll have to come back and no. we'll talk about Nier Automata when you're <laughs> you finish. When I finish it in yeah. 30 years. No, but absolutely. But I had the same experience. I just, I could not stop thinking about it when I first played it. And I'm replaying it now too. And I can't stop thinking about it. So <laughs> I get it. But we're here to talk about a different masterpiece. We're here to talk about Ocarina of Time. And I thought that it would be a poetic way to start the podcast because, and the first episode, because it was the first 3D game that I played. Definitely the first single player 3D game that I played. And it it holds such a special place in my heart. And I think it does for a lot of people. Um, It was, I mean, when it was released, it was such a turning point in gaming and specifically 3D gaming in general of being able to now experience a world that felt a lot more realistic than anything that we could previously do in 2D. And I just thought that game just holds such a such a special place in my heart. So I'm really excited to talk about it. And I'm really excited that I'm I'm here to talk about it with you. So maybe going going back, when did you first play it and how did it impact you? Yeah, honestly, I think in a very similar vein to you, right? It was the first uh, 3D solo, you know, play at your house game. 
Um, and I mean, granted, I was a little bit younger than you were. And by that, I actually mean, I don't think I knew how to read when this game came out and when my, my brothers played it. And so my experience with it is very like that quintessential nostalgic late 90s, early aughts, like family in the game room. I'm watching my brothers play this game. They're telling me what all these cool little creatures are saying to each other. Um, and I was obsessed with it. Like, I, I don't remember, honestly, a lot of the puzzles from back then. I do at this point. But a lot of it was the, the world was so magnificent and so large. And the story was so fantastical um and i actually have a very explicit memory of after they played and beat the game um i love the sequence of escaping ganon's tower with zelda so my parents were throwing some sort of i don't know i think like a new year's party and as i don't know a plucky four-year-old maybe i was like well it's important for me to make this party about me and my experiences so I would <laughs> run around our house and every time I would get to a doorway I would pretend I was Zelda like you know getting rid of the barrier that she does after you finish the little battle sequences yes. and I was yelling like we have to get out we have to kill Ganon and I'm sure all my parents friends were like when is her bedtime is that soon <laughs> um, but yeah so love this game had a huge effect on me since pretty much since I can remember like anything. Oh, I love that so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I I was also too young to play it when it first came out. I played it like years after it came out, but it, it took me so long to get through it. And I was really adamant about like wanting to do most things on my own. And I, I'm very much still the same <laughs> when I'm sure. first playing something. But I will say, fun fact, uh, the first time that I ever used Google, it wasn't for school. It was to figure out how to get through the Gerudo Fortress <laughs> when, you, oh when you need to go save the carpenters. <laughs> Uh -huh. I was like, I need to, I need to find a walkthrough for this, and that was my first like, experience <laughs> as a kid using Google. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. You were like, I could maybe look up, I don't know, a fun fact about wolves or whatever oh, yeah. cool animal you no, were interested no, no. in. But no, how do I get all these keys? I was so stuck. In your defense, it is a very confusing. <laughs> It's all stacked on each other. The game hasn't aged well in some aspects, such as the design of some puzzles. I will say, I mean, the game took me like ages to to beat. I don't actually know how long because I was so young when I played it. But I was looking at playthroughs just as I was prepping for this. And the game is like 10 hours long if you just beeline it. Which I'm like, yeah, if you actually like know how to get, how to get through it, yeah. that is weird yeah. to think about. Yeah, I'm like, seriously, the Deku Tree took me ten hours as a kid, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, yeah, just trying to figure out how to enter into the desert. Absolutely. Right, right. Or like the thing that I really got stumped on as a kid was uh, the spider web right at the entrance of the Deku Tree, where you have to like climb all the way up and then jump. Oh, really? And then I, yeah, and then I just, like, happened to jump off of the ledge, and I was like, oh, okay. You're like, oh, I see. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Ocarina of Time taught me creative thinking and critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I think especially that dungeon out of all of them is one that, like, really rewards that. How do these environmental things interact with each other? How would they in real life? Um so I actually love that's like one of the big puzzles like you really first have to deal with when you play the game. And it it, it sets such a good foundation for the rest of it because it's like, oh, this is a puzzle game. Yeah, exactly. You learn that, you yeah. learn that early on. Absolutely. Um, I love to talk about the narrative of games and just games as a storytelling medium. So with that in mind, what are what are some of your favorite themes that Ocarina of Time explores in its story? Yeah, I think... For me, like, especially returning to it as an adult and having also these childhood memories of it, something that really jumps out to me in the game itself and also, I guess, just meta-narratively is this, this, you know, idea of coming of age growing up is contextually super important, right, with the uh, Ocarina of Time itself and the Master Sword. Uh, but also, I think these two through lines of both a loss of innocence and also community's role 
in AJ, I think really jump out to me. Um, because I think everyone, if you've played the game, probably can immediately notice when you jump those seven years forward, um, there is a huge shift. Hyrule is not fun and light and sunny. And when you go back into, you know, the, the markets where there are very scary, you know, seemingly zombie type things instead of children playing with dogs. Uh, so I think it definitely is upfront about part of aging is like a loss of innocence. This is just to an extreme of everything seems much darker and much scarier. Um, but what I really love as the student of hope is actually the community bonds you form as a child don't go away. Even even with, you know, Ganon coming and harming essentially every single community and every kind of gathering of people and life in Hyrule, um, you still have all these groups of people who are managing and staying alive and trying to protect each other um and they recognize link and even seven years later the effect you had as a as a child um is still so strong and so prevalent and i think that's also why you know the game starts with the deku tree finally acknowledging link and how that's a really huge pivotal moment given that he is not quite a kokiri and not quite um herulian as you discover and you know, wakes up alone and is a very sad little child, really. And then finally, this beloved um, forest guardian says, Hey, Link, come here. You're a Kikiri. Enough for me. You've got a job. Only you can do this. And then it unfurls that everywhere Link goes, he meaningfully helps people and they meaningfully accept him. Whether that's saying, Hey, you know, you're my brother now with Darunia, and here is an important like bracelet that'll let you lift things like we do. Please go into our sacred food land, and then meeting the Zora similarly. They're like, would you please help our guardian? I think all of these different communities are welcoming him with something that's really a cornerstone of them. And then in turn, seven years later, it's because of these connections Link has that he's able to meet with these sages and save Zelda and save Hyrule. Um, and I think, you know, the game can be definitely very sad in its portrayal of the future, uh, but even in that quote-unquote, you know, dark timeline when Ganon has the Triforce, there are these pockets of hope that are purely because of good deeds and goodwill and connection between very different kinds of people. Um, and that's what ultimately really brings the strength and the light back to Hyrule. Um, and now I'm making myself emotional, but <laughs> I just think that's such a really beautiful way to talk about growing older, even amongst this, the scary things and Link having to leave a lot behind and being on his own. He actually, in the end, isn't alone. Um, and he still has all these, all these very different people who care a lot about him and, want to work with him and help him. And I think a lot of games, maybe that approach coming of age or really a lot of stories in general that approach growing up and kind of disillusionment, um, I think don't talk a lot about the importance of community of still finding actually joy in life, you know, and, and motivation and meaning. So that really sticks out to me now as someone who's trying to find all my different communities as I age, you know? But that was that was beautifully said. And I couldn't agree more with everything that you said. And as you were as you were talking through all of that just reminded me of how I felt the very first time that I played the game, because there is something really special about after the time skip, revisiting your relationships with all of these characters. And the first one being with Saria when you get to the Forest Temple, who at the beginning of the game says something along the lines of we'll be friends forever. And I do think mm -hmm. that there's something really, really beautiful about, you know, like you you made such a massive impact on, yes, individual people, but also communities. You you said it better mm -hmm. than I ever could. That was really, really beautiful. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I was rambling. You exactly. Thank you for summarizing my point very eloquently. The one thing that, that also really struck me when I first played it was this relationship between nature and honoring nature and greed and how one person's greed can have such a massive destructive impact on so many people. And I remember, especially when I first played it, that that's what kept me motivated to keep mm -hmm. going. But also, I mean, the relationships that, to your point, that 
we have with all of these characters when we're young also kept me going. But I just remember that greed and just wanting to to go against that greed and defy that greed um, was 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 huge when I first played it. Yeah, for sure. I really want to talk about uh, my favorite video essay on Ocarina of Time and huge shout out to Good Blood on YouTube for creating it. I'll link it in the description. And I love like we have a, a little Google Doc where we were like prepping a few notes <laughs> And I wrote, I'll elaborate and give a brief summary. No stress, no pressure to watch it. You were like, I've seen it three times already. Yeah. <laughs> I think, don't worry. It's I'm so ready good. to engage on that video alone if I have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. We could talk about that for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it because it argues that Ocarina of Time is the saddest Zelda story that no one noticed. And talks about the fact that throughout a lot of the series, sorrow and sadness seems to be a really big theme. And in Majora's Mask, we see that really outwardly, where you could analyze that game just by looking at through the lens of the five stages of grief. And it it works. Yeah. In Twilight Princess, the the beginning dialogue of the game talks about sadness and lingering regret versus Ocarina of Time feels like this like very fantastical adventure on the surface of kind of good versus evil. But when you dig down, it's also this story of, as I said earlier, nature versus greed, but also, as you said, childhood versus adulthood. And that there's this sadness that's like buried underneath like the adventure storyline. And one thing that really stood out to me as I was watching it was this idea that Link is a dual citizen. He's Hylian, but he's also Kakiri because he has Navi with him. He has a, a fairy. And this idea that Kakiri can't, can't leave the Kakiri forest or they die. So the Kakiri forest is this like really insulated place that represents childhood and outsiders also can't come in or they turn into Stalfos. And... At the very end of the game, when Zelda sends Link back in time to this world that doesn't remember him, Navi leaves him, essentially severing his connection to his childhood and his childhood home, which to me, I never thought about the game in that way. And then that Link eventually goes on and is the same Link in Majora's Mask. But I'm rambling a little bit, but what do you think about this notion of Ocarina of Time being the saddest Zelda story that no one noticed? I definitely... I, I do think the game puts a lot of the sorrow pretty up front. Um, and I, I agree that so much of it, though, is easy to miss, especially when you are, you know, a young child playing this game and you're focused on, well, you know, the Zora place is full of waterfalls and now it's icy and I got to fix it. But it is, you know, I do think a lot about that, the good timeline, right, or whatever Nintendo's timeline nonsense is. But when he, he goes back in time and Navi leaves him, uh, only he has to, you know, deal with these memories that never happened. And that in itself is a very, very, uh, actually like in the true meaning of the word, kind of like tragic situation uh, that he just has to live on with. But then I always, I always wonder when, Zelda sends him back. I like to believe she sends him back right before he would have pulled out, you know, the sword or whatever. So Ganon's fixed. He never gets the Triforce, but he still has these happy memories with these other, you know, with, with the Gorons, with the Zora. Um, and that maybe, you know, he hangs out with Zelda for a bit before he goes on this adventure and goes to a terrible alternate timeline. Uh, who can say? But Either way, I do think it says a lot about, you know, a branching path almost um, and that the what if on the other side, except in this case, Link sees through one entire path and then goes back to the, the beginning and no longer has that, that branch even available to him, which is sad. Uh, and he can't go back to see Saria because one of them will die if they try to leave, right, to see each other, which is sad. And uh, Navi is really this one, this one figure who guides him to meet all of these various people. So for my own heart's sake, I like to believe, right, he can go still see Darunia and, and Ruto and Zelda. Um, but I guess the, the game definitely leaves it open enough to really wonder where, where Link ends up and what Link's kind of purpose is if he doesn't have a big quest. Because before he had his quest, he was just kind of miserable and alone and... What does that mean after he finishes it? 
And I guess in a sense, he goes off to find another one and does find one. But (laughs) what does he do after that? Agreed. And you touched on something that I love about the series as a whole, and that's that it asks so many questions. It leaves a lot of things open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whatever game we look at, we could probably find something to theorize about. But I I 100% agree. So sad. So sad. (laughs) (laughs) Just someone give my little boy a hug. Going back to, we spoke about the Deku Tree being a great first dungeon, a great first introduction. Um, yes. Do you do you have a favorite dungeon in general in the game? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. Um, in some ways, I I do actually think that Deku Tree might be my favorite, just because you you do get this buildup of, ooh, I'm in a very big dungeon. There are some more stakes here. You know, it's not just these sedentary Deku plants snapping at me, and it feels a little bit more dangerous. But also, I mean, that entire puzzle, that entire dungeon is nothing but childlike wonder of a giant treehouse with scary big bugs, and you can climb on everything. And the puzzles are, hey, jump down from this physics. You know, you don't have any items at that point. You have a sword, a shield, and you get a slingshot. So it has to be very, how would a child kind of solve these problems? Um And I think it sets the stage really well for building complexity as the game goes on. You know, you discover these time switches, you learn more about thinking spatially. And I think, especially considering, you know, this is the first 3D adventure game most anyone played. Uh, I guess they, they also could have done Mario first, but this really was an entrance to thinking about solving game puzzles and combat in three dimensions. And I think this dungeon is just a very elegant setup for that and and for the, how the rest of the game functions. Um, so in many ways, you know, it was kind of genre defining. I can, I can kind of rave about that from like game design view for a while. Um, but I'd say the other dungeon, yeah, the other dungeon I'm, I'm very fond of and I kind of wish I did more with was uh, the Spirit Temple with switching between Young and Adult Link. And I get probably why they didn't because to switch between Young and Adult Link is incredibly out of the way. But after you get, you know, the teleport song, uh, I'd love to see more of that. Adding in that layer of I'm solving a puzzle in 3D and also temporally, which I think they do in a lot of other small cases with like Deku beans, not Deku beans, uh, beans sprouts. But I love for more of that back and forth. Yeah. What's your favorite? But before I answer that, did you <laughs> when you first played it, <laughs> maybe or what is the correct way to play it? Is it Shadow Temple, Spirit Temple or Spirit Temple, Spirit Temple, Shadow Temple? <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay, so this is something <laughs> that's been a huge debate. <laughs> no, this is a really great question. I think so okay. I actually have a lot of thoughts about this because when we first played it, uh, my brothers and I did it wrong in a way that not a lot of people even talk about. We played the fire dungeon and got to the point where we got the Megaton hammer and then so going in order, right? We went forest fire. Oh, okay. I was like, you started with fire? That's possible. <laughs> no, Lord, no. I, I really don't think it. it is. But we, we got the hammer, but we were really frustrated with another puzzle, so we couldn't get to the boss. So we left, and then we did all of the water dungeon. And then we Whoa. came back and finished the fire. Yeah, and I feel like Whoa. no other people talk about Yeah, because if you get the hammer, Whoa. you can leave and you can finish the water dungeon. Right, yeah. Uh, the water temple. Yeah, so, and then we did shadow. We ended up doing shadow spirit because and I still I normally still play in that order because you go to Kakariko and you see Sheik and I'm like all bets are off I have to deal with this right now Um, and I I feel like if the spirit dungeon was just like a or temple excuse me was just like a little bit closer and more easy to discover I I do actually think that could be a really nice path because a shadow temple ends and it's just such a very different energy and is very morose that I think thematically it can set up really well to let's uh, go take care of Ganon. Uh, but yeah, I, otherwise I've never done the spirit temple before the shadow. Same. And I think it's yeah. because I would, I would go back to Kakariko and it almost felt like a, like a familiar home base as an adult because you can't Absolutely. go to Castle Town. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I a hundred percent agree. Um, I've, I've always played shadow and then spirit as well. Um, but to answer your earlier question, I think maybe the forest temple is my favorite. Yeah. I wonder how many people would say the same. I, I think it's because 
there's something so magical about going back to the woods after you're an adult because it's where you start the game. But after the time skip, going back and then entering this place that it's it's literally haunted. You're you're looking uh-huh. for pose. Um I love the bow as an item and the music, just the the presentation and the environment is just so good. It tells such a great story because as you as you kind of progress through through the woods and you talk um, the lost woods and you talk to different NPCs and you learn that you know adults that come here become Stalfos. There's something just really haunting about that. And so when you enter the temple, and I really think that so much of it is the music and the lighting. It's just this like really okay. dark, creepy place and. I just love the entire energy of of the Forest Temple. Just loved it. And I love the boss battle against Phantom Ganon and playing Dead Man's yes. Volley. It's like so fun. What a great, great concept um, with like the artwork and the paintings. It's just so good. So, so good. Totally agree. Yeah, and really juxtaposing that against also inside the Deku Tree, you know, as your two first temples, really, for each era. I also think exactly what you're saying, the Forest Temple sets up, okay, things are not going to be as cutesy now. This place is haunted, and there are eyes watching you everywhere. It's it's a very different, chilling experience. So I, I, I also agree. The music is so good. I can hear like a little echoing right here in my voice. You know, it's it's so iconic. It's so good. It really is. It really is. I, I want to ask, but now I'm I'm so curious what the answer to this question is going to be. I was going to ask, is your least favorite dungeon the water temple? But maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, I love how you phrase it. It's not like, what's your least favorite? It is it the water temple. Is it the water temple? Uh, I I do actually think, okay, so I have two minds on this. Uh, I guess my answer is one way or another, a water temple is my least favorite because when I was young and quite frankly still now, I'm not going to give myself too much credit. I can never do water levels. I can never keep track of them in any game when you can adjust them. So I, I just, I don't think it is a bad dungeon. I just think I'm spatially inept in that sense. So it's so hard for me to keep track of where do I need to raise the water? Where is it right now? But when I was younger, inside Jabu Jabu's belly was actually, I hated that one because it, it just was kind of gross. I was like, why does, why does he have all these undulating things in him oh let me fix this poor fish guardian um but yeah i would i would probably say the water temple is my least favorite if i was a better capital g gamer it probably (laughs) wouldn't be but it is yeah I, i actually i don't know if it's my least favorite i think i i think it's like jabba jabba's belly might be my least favorite yeah because of what you said it's just like Because it's just gross. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like, why are we here? Why can't we? Isn't there, isn't there like anywhere else where we could go, please? I just want, I don't want to see guts. I don't want to be inside a living being. (laughs) I don't (laughs) need it. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't don't, need it. I really don't. I really don't. Um, I'm like, I might be misremembering this, but I remember not finding the water temple as bad as maybe other people people did don't get me wrong i got stuck in so many places in the game Uh so many places but i remember for the water temple specifically when you learn the water mechanic you're like oh i gotta put my serious hat on and i like yeah i I gotta really think about you know where these switches are going and sometimes i would mess it up and i'd be like no i'm not gonna mess that up again i just got really stubborn maybe yeah maybe inside jabba jabba's belly wasn't wasn't the biggest fan wasn't the biggest fan I honestly think as well, probably the reason why the Water Temple has the rap it does is that people don't like backtracking that much. Mm, And I don't think mm -hmm. the other dungeons involve nearly as much as that one does. Mm, And so it can feel very like, ugh, this again? But to your credit and to your point, like if you're thinking about it as, okay, this is new now. Now I'm keeping track of where I'm at. I actually think it does a lot with objectively like much smaller spaces. Maybe I'll maybe I'll replay it and then I'll report back. <laughs> yeah, be like, ah, you know, twenty years later, does it hold up? Yeah, um, yeah exactly, exactly. Absolutely. 
<laughs> Going back to what you said earlier, though, about community and the people that you meet, I think that that is one of the most important things in the game and the glue of the game and the heart and the soul of the game. Because you're right, you meet you meet so many people when you're young and then you meet them again when you're older and they remember you and there's something really special about that and about the communities that you're a part of and that you touch. Do you have any favorite characters just generally in the game? Yeah, uh, I do. I saw so just off the bat, I mean, a huge Zelda and Sheik fan. Um, and it is so, you know, it's, it's very ubiquitous, like now knowledge, like, oh yeah, Zelda Sheik, especially because of, you know, Super Smash Bros and everything. But that reveal was so mind blowing to, to me the first time I witnessed it, because they do, you know, probably if I thought a little critically about it, and also wasn't like four, maybe I could have put it together. But they do go through pretty good efforts of we're using different pronouns in the English localization. And she's got red eyes now. And you've never seen Zelda do any of this stuff. And it isn't really discussed that she's Chica broadly anyway. Uh, so seeing that moment and realizing actually Zelda has been here helping me out this entire time, just like she did with her letter when we were young, is such a really cool thematic tie-in. As well as just something, you know, I was thinking about, again, Little Lonely Link doesn't have any friends. And he finally meets this, like, highly girl who's really excited and is like, look at this big bad guy. We're going to spy on him and then we're going to go fix the world. And it's very a juvenile adventure that suddenly gets ripped away from Link and becomes very serious. And so then knowing that actually as an adult on this very serious journey, Zelda has still been with him this whole time makes me a little emotional, I won't lie. So I, I really love just that entire arc of, of their relationship helping each other. And I know people are right to say it sucks she turns into a princess and then gets kidnapped, but I also feel like Zelda actually has quite a bit of agency in this game. Uh, so she's... She's great. I uh, love Zelda. Go to bat for her any day. <laughs> yeah, but other other characters, uh, I'm very fond of Darunia. I, I think, especially because the other characters you really meet when you're younger are around your age, mostly. You know, you meet... Um, so, you know, Malin is young and, and kind of shares that excitement uh, for the world. Princess Ruto is, is very young and is, like, also very you know, naive, let's get married. But Darunia is, I think, outside of the Deku tree, who does, you know, also unfortunately die in front of Link, the first kind of older role model he has who views him as a peer and as a brother. And I I think just the sequences with him are so full of joy, the dance sequence, and then knowing, in you know, in the future, Darunia is alive, he's not hidden, and he's actually going to, like, save his people. And so I, I think that's a really great character through line for Link as kind of this almost older brother or father figure type of what it means to be, like, saving your people. So I'm a big fan of Darunia. I don't think he gets enough enough love. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's something really wholesome about that. He uses, you know, brother language a lot. There's something really wholesome about that friendship and that brotherhood. I totally agree. I, I also love Sheik. I was obsessed with Sheik mm -hmm. as a kid. I was like, who is this? Mm -hmm. Who is this person that's just here now helping me, you know, teaching me? They seem really mysterious and mystical. And then the reveal that there's Zelda is just like, yes, Zelda's a badass. I just, I loved yes. it so much. I loved it so much. I'll, I'll maybe add Saria to that list as well, because I remember my my first experience playing it. You you really do feel like an outsider and, and the story kind of primes you for it. And it's like you're the only one without a fairy and then you finally get one. But Saria never treated you differently when you didn't have a fairy. And, and then when you got Navi. And I love that. And I think that there's something really pure about Link and Saria's friendship. And I remember when you leave Kakiri Forest and she gives you your first ocarina Oh, that yeah. was, oh, that was sad. That was so sad. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good point. Just talking about music. I had, I can't believe I didn't bring that up yet. Talking about Oh, Ocarina we'll talk time. about music. Let's talk about the music. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's like such a pivotal moment. I just think also really 
truly tying back to community. I mean, like music is such a joyful thing that you do. You perform with people or you perform for people. And the game, you know, literally named after this magical instrument that your childhood friend gives you. Two of them end up giving you one. And I think that the moment, again, when Saria is like, you're leaving, I can't come with you. And I can tell this is going to be a really big deal. Here's a, you know, an instrument, remember me with it. And here's the song I always sing. And then going and learning songs from all the various people you meet is, is such a beautiful touchstone of Link carrying it with him, of all the relationships he has. And then those are, you know, made quite literally powerful with it can take him to the places where he learned the song and where his friends are. Just like music can transport us places, but except now it's quite literal. And then as well, you know, the power of music with his animal friend. I'm so sorry if you can hear the siren. It's so funny. They're like, you heard music? But yeah, I, I think that's also, you know, it's a very beautiful metaphor made really literal and also a huge part of so many people's memories of this game is the you know the soundtrack of it it gets remixed so much you know you have touring live orchestras playing the music of it i think it is yeah to your point earlier just about the forest temple i i truly think the music of this game is just as pivotal as a a moment as the mechanics or as the characters agreed especially when like the original game it looked amazing for that time, but looking back for at it that now, <laughs> you know, when you com- when you compare it to kind of modern games, it you know it it has aged, and so I really think that the music is just so nostalgic and is is like the glue that holds everything together, the entire experience Absolutely. together from from the title screen all the way to I actually really love the final battle music too, um, mm-hmm. but I just remember. I love the Song of Time and specifically in the Temple of Time. And I would just go back to the Temple of Time and just listen to the music because I loved it so much. Yeah. And then some of the teleportation songs I really love, too. I love the Minuet of Forest and the Serenade of Water and the Requiem of Spirit. Mm -hmm. I really love the Cockerigo Village theme. I just that entire soundtrack is just magical, magical. Koji Kondo went off. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I do have some favorites. I think um, of the songs you play, uh, I've always really loved the Nocturne of Shadow. That's what I would play a lot and then be like, no, I don't want to teleport. And then play it again and be like, no, I don't want to teleport. Um, I do not. Um, but I also, just the title theme. Also, I mean, maybe this is a product of you boot up the game and you get distracted. So you kind of listen to it for a long time, but I think it is so yearnful. Is that a word? Sorrowful. I really think it sets up the game and this idea of like passing of time and also big adventure ahead while feeling like a very eye of the hurricane called moment. And the music of the Tirado Valley, of course, also gets me oh, hyped like nothing so else. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could sit here and talk about the music of the game for hours. That's his own episode. That's another one. Yeah, works. exactly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and listen to it after this. It's <laughs> just the whole soundtrack. Yeah, literally me back. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But maybe, maybe to to wrap us up, any random facts or like memories that you have relating to the game, or any final thoughts about the game? Oh, so many. I mean, I feel like it's a game that I return to really regularly and in so many different ways of engaging with it um you know i'll replay it pre- pretty regularly we have a, uh, I have i took it with me haha the uh the collector's edition like gamecube game yes. that has it yes. uh, so yeah i still play that a lot um and i think it's just really i get like meta narratively beautiful or whatever that this is a game about growing up quickly and, and how the world changes around you and where you fit in with it. And that it's something that I come back to, you know, pretty much every year. Uh, and also just, I don't know, I think the development of love that this game has for so many reasons, right? Of being this pivotal first 3D Zelda game, of being this first 3D adventure game broadly, um, and being a huge you know, mechanic setting, design setting, like foundation for this series and it's exploded and is everywhere now. People really love it. And so I 
really regularly actually will put on, you know, speed runs and randomizers and stuff of this game just as background noise <laughs> because the sounds of the game are so nostalgic for me even. So, yeah, but I think a, a, another fun memory that I'll share uh, is when I was older, after we played it a couple times, um, I still asked my mom to help me make a Halloween costume so I could be Link. And I was definitely that child running around in my little tunic and people would call me Peter Pan and I would get so indignant about it. I was absolutely not Peter Pan. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, maybe to, maybe to wrap us up, the last thing I wanted to touch on is I just really love the writing of the game. It just, it's so poetic and I've, I've taken a few note, um, a few quotes out of the game. You know, melody that will draw you into infinite darkness. The flow of time is always cruel. A childish mind will turn to noble ambition. Like it's, it's very poetic. And I think that it, it helps weave the story so well. I just think all of the elements come together so, so, so well. But yeah, I just wanted to to touch on that. And yeah. it, it felt as though, as as I first played it, it felt as though there was always a double meeting to everything. And I just loved that so much. I love when a game makes me think when I'm not playing it. And I'll be like, what does yes. that mean? <laughs> and maybe maybe that's why, like, anytime I play any other Zelda game, I'm like, oh, what does this mean? Is it related to anything else in any other game? And just, I just love the series so much. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're so right. And it loves its callbacks. The series loves its callbacks. Oh, it does. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about Breath of the Wild for ages and ages Everything and ages. Everything pulls. Absolutely. And just, yeah, it, yeah. But to wrap us up, you have time to plug anything that you want. The floor is yours. Oh. Whatever whatever you want to plug. We'll, we'll put socials in the Jeez. description, too. But Absolutely. Uh, it's so funny. You caught me in a time where I'm not actively working on a project to plug. Uh, so I think what I will plug instead uh, is everybody, uh, go to your local like Board of Education education open meetings. This is such a random thing. But like, just give it a shot once. Even if you don't have a, you know, especially if you don't have a child in the educational system, check it out. What are they talking about? Get involved. It's important to care about your local community and support your teachers, especially after uh, a couple years where universally, I think teachers were really struggling. So get involved. It's a great way to then also meet other things that you might care about in your community, since that's such a theme of this episode. <laughs> Everyone's like, I did not see that coming. But I loved it so much. I'll, I'll second that for sure. I will second that. Kinsey, thank you so much for being here. This was so fun. Marina, thank you so much. I had so much fun. I, you know, you were like, we prepped notes. And I was like, yeah, I thought about these things. And then I start talking and a thousand more things came to me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just, it's how the game is. There's, there's, just, there's so much to talk about. I mean, we, we could keep going for another four hours. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I just really appreciate it having me on for the first episode. This yeah, has been a great time course. and I'm excited of to course. hear all the future ones. Absolutely. I mean, you'll have to come back for something. Oh, of course. <laughs> Say the word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Kinsey, thank you so much. Um, enjoy your coffee. Enjoy all the coffee that you made. Yes. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. Thanks again. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Hi, and thank you so much for tuning in to the first episode. If you want to follow along, please do. We've got tons of games that we're going to be talking about, and I'm so excited for what's next. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great day and talk soon. Bye.